I don't know if it's legit for women to speak, but I'm speaking, sorry. <laughs> um, so 10 years ago, after my grandfather died, um, I videotaped my grandmother. And I heard her story and I sat and listened to it last night. Because there was always a little ambiguity about what happened in her the course of her life. All I ever heard is that she was hidden by the nuns. And actually that wasn't true. That's not really, that's not true. <laughs> that's not what happened. So I wanted to tell her story. And I think a testament to who she was is she was actually doing and thriving and doing so well before the pandemic. She was interactive and verbal. And once the pandemic hit and she didn't have access to people, her family, and to socialize, she very, very quickly regressed. Which just again shows you the kind of person she was. She was an extrovert. She loved people. She loved being around people. And one of the things she said a few times in the videotape is I always had to be moving. I always had to be active. She said it a number of times, you know, you know, almost as if she had underlying ADHD or something. <laughs> she made it seem that way, that she always, always had to be moving and moving. So she was born in 1920 and there was 11 children in her family. She had nine brothers and one sister and she was the eighth child. And she talked about those who survived in the war. There were five children who survived and she had one sister. Her sister um, died, Pessy. Well, I'm, I'm, af I'm named after her mother and her sister. And her sister died with seven boys, seven children. The whole entire family was wiped out. Um, she was about 23 or 24 years old during the war. And her story is an absolute incredible one because her will to survive is unprecedented. One of her, one of her father's workers came to the house and had Rahmanas on the family and said, please come with me, I'll save you. And every single one of the children, except for her and her, one of her brothers, went with this man because she said to herself that she wanted to survive no matter what. Nobody else went. And after one day, her brother went back. She was the only one who stayed there because she had the will to survive and didn't want to stay to succumb to the Nazis. She was sleeping in the hay, in, in the hay where the cows left. And after one week, the mother-in-law of the family came and said, you have to get rid of her. She's, she's a threat, you know, they're gonna kill us. And she, ne she knew she needed to leave, obviously. So the man from the household who originally took her, took her to the city and she went into a pharmacy and she begged them and she said, please, please, could I have a job? And from there, she worked for two months as a childcare worker for a family. Then again, she was at risk and she knew that she was, the family was threatened. She had to leave, she had to pick herself up from there. After that, a priest took her in and she was there for eight months and she took care of their 13 month old child. But she went from home to home and she kept on saying in the film, she kept on saying, I was, I kept on watching and making sure that I was not going to succumb, that I was gonna stay alive no matter what. She was always, always watching after her safety. <coughs> after she went to Germany and then after Germany, she went to the US. Zadie's sister, my grandfather's sister and some aunts and uncles were in the US and she told about her story about what it was like to come to the US, which was very difficult in and of itself. She went to the Upper East Side at first for two years and then went to the Bronx. Lower East Side. Lower East Side, I'm sorry. What did I say? Upper. Okay, L sorry, Lower East Side and then two years she went to the Bronx. And the only thing she said she wanted was for her kids to have a Jewish education. She wanted them to study and to learn and for them to be nice and good children. And just a funny example is I have a PhD. So she always used to say to me, you're a doctor, you couldn't be a real doctor? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
but she always talked about she so we know that she had a little bit of a critical side to her <laughs> so every time i would come in the door she would like look me up and down you know but you were kind of used to that it was it was out of like love and admiration it was it was done in, in yes <laughs> yes <laughs> this is too much go get a haircut to my father this every there was always comments always comments um she talked about how she wasn't able to sit still. She sewed, she made tablecloths, she made sweaters. She dusted. She, dusted. she, was, she was married for 65 years. But one thing that you always felt from her was unconditional love. And every grandchild, and I know this, felt as if they were the favorite grandchild. <laughs> <laughs> And I could, <laughs> I actually know who the favorites were. <laughs> okay. See, Eva and Andrea really know who the favorites were. <laughs> just, just say, don't ask them. But, okay. So I want, I want to say that my grandmother personally impacted my career choice because of her trauma and everything she experienced. I personally wanted to help those that were traumatized, and that's what I do for a living. And I, I also have to tell you a story which was so meaningful. I remember growing up, my aunt and my father, or my aunt more so, but would complain that my grandmother wouldn't say I love you. She didn't have... <laughs> she, she said I love you to all of them, but Well, not but I'll tell you, this, this is very interesting. She couldn't, she, she was very traumatized. That's a hell of a question. Yes. And she had difficulty showing any kind of vulnerability or intimacy. And you knew that about her. She she looked in your eye and you knew she loved you, but she wouldn't express it. And they couldn't. And, I, and, and couldn't. And I remember when I was like a teenager, I, I, I thought to myself, I don't get it. She's not expressing I love you. Why can't we express I love you? You know? So I went over to her. I remember this. And I sat with her. And I go, Bubby, I love you. And she looked at me and she said, I love you. And ever since then, throughout my years, she would always say I love you to me all the time. And the last, I have to really tell you about her death. Because it was so incredible. I was sitting on her bed and I was stroking her and I was telling her I loved her and I was kissing her for hours. And I just decided, I thought to myself, I want to sing to her. There was something that just led me to want to sing in her ear. So I leaned over to her and I started singing Hush Little Baby. <laughs> I started saying, hush, little baby, and I sang it, I sang it, and then I said to myself, you know what? I will, I'm going to sing Shema Yisrael to her, because I know it's going to be meaningful. And I started singing Shema Yisrael in her ear, and I looked at her, and she took her last breath. She heard me. She died in peace. She reacted to a Jewish song and something that she felt connected to. And I believe that it was meant to be that way. So she personally gave me a gift that I'll never forget. So thank you.